Hey guys, so I am trying to make these videos more regular, but honestly I just finished writing exams and I don't have a soul anymore, but I do want to say that if anyone like me has also finished exams or you're still writing, I'm holding thumbs for all of you because I think people have just really underestimated how difficult it is to be learning under these COVID conditions and honestly, no matter what the outcome is, if you finish this year, you're a winner. Um, at least that's what I'm telling myself, but I digress. Today we're going to be doing a section I love. It's Compound Financial Instruments, which is IAS 32 and FS9. And it's lovely because once you get it, you got it. So today we're just gonna get it. Cool. <laughs> Awesome source. So before we look at compound financial instruments, let's just discuss a financial instrument. And what a financial instrument is, is defined in IAS 32 paragraph 11, and it is a contract that gives rise to a financial asset in one entity and a financial liability or equity instrument in another entity. And you can think of it like a bank. When a bank loans us money, that is obviously a liability to us because we owe them payments and interest. Whereas the bank is receiving those payments and interest, so it's an asset to them. But in the case of compound compound financial instruments, as the name suggests, we've got both a liability component and an equity component. And this must be assessed at the inception of the contract, i.e. am I dealing with a liability, equity component or both for the interest portion? Am I dealing with a liability, equity or both component <laughs> for the capital portion? And the most common example of this would be a convertible instrument. So for example, where you as the issuer give the holder of the compound financial instrument or CFI the option either to redeem this financial instrument for cash or for a certain amount of shares at the redemption date. So you can see because there's an option either to receive cash or shares and you as the entity are most likely making regular coupon payments, both a liability and an equity component exist. In some cases, the entity who issues these financial instruments can make the decision whether they want the holders of the financial instruments to either receive cash or to receive shares. And this will just affect the present value inputs, but we'll get into that now. The gist of recognizing a compound financial instrument at inception is that first Firstly, we're recognizing a liability component, and secondly, we're recognizing an equity component. This equity component is referred to as your compound financial instrument reserve, E. And so this is where the fun part begins. So let's go through step one. Okay, the first step is super fun, nice and easy. We are calculating the present value of our liability component. So I'm gonna give us an example. Let's say we issue a convertible loan for 100,000 Rand par value that is redeemable in five years time, and maybe our coupon payments are at 5%, and at the end of the five years, the holders have the option either receive in cash or receive a set amount of shares. And the interest rate that we're gonna use in this case is a market-related interest rate for a similar instrument, but without the conversion option. And that's the rate you always use in this case. And let's, for example, say it's 10%. So these are our values. So in our financial calculator, or if you are super good at financial maths, I guess you could use a formula, but our future value input is gonna be negative 100,000. And that's because if we give the holders the option of conversion, we're gonna assume the worst case scenario, which is that they choose cash, i.e. it's a cash alpha for us. If we had the option of choosing whether they were going to be issued shares or cash, then we would, as the entity, assume that our future value is nothing, as in we are not having any outflow, we'd rather issue shares. It's cheaper for us. So just remember, in the case where we have the choice, our future value is zero. If they have the choice, the future value will be whatever that par value at redemption is. Our payments are gonna be our coupon rate of 5% times by our par value of 100,000. And obviously it's negative because we are paying those regular payments. Let's make them annual. Our interest rate is 10%. As I said, it's the interest rate for a similar instrument without the conversion option. And our N or our number of payment periods is five. And remember that it's not a number of years. It refers to the number of payments. And because there are five annual payments, it's five. Therefore, we plug that into our financial calculator. We get our present value to be and the next step is to calculate our equity component, which is super easy because we know our account equation as being assets equals equity plus liabilities, right? What we're looking for is our equity component. So if we rearrange this equation, we get that equity is equal to our assets minus liabilities. So in this case, our asset is 100,000 Rand because what we've received when we've issued these debentures is that we're receiving 100,000 Rand into our bank, which as we know is an asset. And then our liability component we've just worked out is the present value of 81,046 Rand. And that's our equity component. And so our journal entry is gonna be super easy and awesome. We're gonna debit our bank because we're receiving 100,000 Rand when we issue, and then a credit to our liability and our equity components. 
And as always with anything in financial accounting, you have to keep in mind deferred tax consequences. So when we think about deferred tax, we've always got in mind what our carrying amount is in accounting, what our tax base is in tax, and therefore what our temporary difference is. So in this case, our carrying amount of our liability is what we calculated to be the 81,046, right? That's how much our liability is worth. But our tax base will be 100,000 Rand. And that's because although we will ultimately get Section 24J interest implications for tax, right? This hasn't happened yet at inception. Therefore, we have a deductible temporary difference of 18,954, which we will note is the equity component. And that's because the additional recognition of the equity component in our accounting gave rise to this temporary difference. So therefore, our deferred tax is going to be the equity component or the temporary difference multiplied by 28% or whatever your tax rate is. And this will be allocated to our equity component with the effect of reducing it. So we're going to debit our CFI reserve and credit deferred tax profit or loss. And then also to note, our liability component is also going to fluctuate, right, with the interest and with the payments. But because then our carrying amount of the liability is changing and our tax base is also changing with Section 24J deductions, our temporary difference will change. So this deferred tax will also fluctuate. I'm going to say this is kind of step three of this whole process. And the last thing I'll touch on, and probably the last thing you'll need to remember for this section, is transaction costs. So if we have transaction costs at inception, firstly, we're going to calculate the present value of the liability and equity component as we did in the first two steps. And then we have to apportion the transaction cost between the equity component and the liability component. So if our transaction costs were 10,000 Rand, if we apportion this now between our liability and equity component, the liability portion would be, and the same sort of vibe for the equity component, obviously with a different numerator. And then if you get confused, do I add this or subtract this from the component? Just think about this. We, when we pay transaction costs, are crediting our bank. Therefore, the opposite entry would be to debit something else. And in this case, we're gonna be debiting the equity component and debiting the liability component. So it is decreasing those components, something like that. And that's all. CFIs are super simple. It's basically four things you need to keep in mind. Your liability component, your equity component, deferred tax and transaction costs. And once you've got that, you've got it forever and well done to you. Cool. So thanks for watching. If you guys have any, I don't know, topics in mind that you find difficult, chances are I also find it difficult. So making a video would also be very helpful to me. <laughs> yeah, just let me know in the comments. Okay, cool. Have a nice day. Peace.